So good morning, everybody. This is Joyce Brown from the Brookline Senior Center, and we're talking about uh, mending, things that we can do at home. We all have mending to do. So I'm going to be recording the session here, and I'll put it out for anyone who is not able to come this morning. But I put these slides together with thanks to all of you who submitted questions in advance on the mending challenges that you're facing. And I'll just review what we talked about last week, that they're, depending on the fabric, you have slightly different challenges in dealing with uh, mending things. So if you have a hole in the middle of something knitted, you can see you've disconnected the yarn, which usually travels up and down like this across, but it holds the loop above it and is held by the loop below it. So when you disconnect these threads, you can see that the thread will just continue to ravel. And you've seen that with a sweater or a sock or something that's knitted, that it'll continue to unravel. So when you try to mend this hole, the trick is to go and secure all those stray ends, make sure that they're not going to go anywhere, uh, the hole's not going to get bigger, and then try to patch through the hole. So with woven fabric, it's the same basic principle, but the, the way the threads travel is different. And Margaret talked about lace and the things that she does with lace as well. But the, the basic principles are the same. The goals are to keep the tear from getting any worse, to make the fabric look whole again, to keep the garment or quilt in service, and to make sure it survives the washing machine. So, and there may be other considerations, like is this an antique that you treasure and so forth. Um, so depending on what you're doing, you'll look at the challenges. What kind of fabric is it? Where's the stress? So if the hole is in the knee or the elbow or the waist or the underarm, there are stresses that it's going to be undergoing and you wanna make sure that it doesn't happen again. Why did it tear? Does it need more room? Like maybe it's a little too small in the shoulder or the waist or something like that. And how visible is it going to be? Is it on the front of the shirt or the tail of the shirt? And how comfortable does it need to be? Like socks, knees, elbows, or could you simply put a patch on it? And um, the woven thread has fabrics going both left to right and top to bottom. We need to stop it fraying at the edges and to darn or patch to strengthen the fabric. So, uh, and the knitted fabric, the same thing. Keep it from unraveling and darn it or patch it. Here's some patch ideas. And you can see this is a sweater. And you remember the old university professor with patches on the elbows. Um, elbows are one place that fabric often gives way. Another, from Harvard. I'm sorry? <laughs> the professors think? from Harvard always wore those patches. That's right, that's right. So these are even fashionable some patches. Of them my, some of them were my professors in college. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> and you can see the funny patches they put on children's knees. Knees are another uh, popular place for holes to appear. And here they took the, the pockets off of an older pair of jeans and put them on the knees to function as a patch. So the, the patch can be anything you want it to be. This is a Japanese method. It's called sashiko patching and they'll keep clothes in, in use for a long, long time, and sometimes put patches on top of patches. But you can see here, they've put a reinforcing piece of material under, and then just stitch across it. Just nowadays, they should, excuse me, nowadays they sell them with the holes and they charge you extra money because they're holy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they do. I remember one time, um, and this was years ago, because my son now is 50, but when he was in his teens, I had he was at the doctor with me one time, and the doctor looked at me and said, couldn't you at least have patched his jeans? 
<laughs> you know, holes in the knees. He thought it was very stylish. The doctor thought it was really awful. So there are neater ways to patch things. And this is a, a quilt that I repaired. And you can see there are some patches in this. Can you find the patches? Yes. OK. Hi, Millicent. Hi. Hi. So where it's do you see four this? patches, four patches, four. Good. So here's one. I'll show you. See, you see me? It? Can you see me? Uh, no, I don't see your picture yet. But you can see the, the patch here, the orange fabric is a little bit different. I couldn't actually match this fabric, but I this put in the different. This one looks brighter. This I'm sorry. orange looks brighter than these uh, two sides. That's right. So you can see this is a different fabric. But this, this little quilt actually was chewed by the dog. And I don't have a before picture. I should have taken a before picture. But when it came to me, it, first of all, it smelled like a dog. <laughs> and secondly, it had a big hole in the middle. Uh, so I've actually done a lot of repair on this center patch. And then these two areas were chewed at the edges. So this has been resuscitated from quite a lot of da damage. Here's another one. I had to replace a couple of these patches because the, the fabric was worn through. And this, this is an interesting quilt. It had a chin guard on it. Back in the old days, this was made in 1925. And men had chin whiskers and also tended to use pomade, uh, a sort of cream on their beards so that it would look wonderful but the problem is it would it would come off on your uh linens do you remember they used to have an it's called an anti macassar um they it would put a like a doily on the back of a chair claire do you remember those yeah they're out of style now they crocheted everything that's right. They were crocheted. They were frequently crocheted. They didn't crochet uh, the ends of the pillowcases. Right. Plain white pillowcase, you crochet different things. Yes, my mother did that too. Anyway, this is a removable piece because you would, would have to launder this more frequently than you would launder the quilt. And don't forget, in, the, in 1925, that washing machines were not up to taking a quilt. So you were doing this by hand. So this, this piece was so that you could launder that most, most frequently used part of the quilt without taking the whole thing. And then you had this running stitch holding it in place, but you can remove that pretty easily in order to launder the quilt. So these are all things that I've repaired. This I do have a before picture you can see that this part of the quilt is really badly deteriorated. And the whole, pl the whole thing was yellowed, considerably yellowed. So how did I repair it? What I did was I added another border. This is new material. And I mitered the corners. And I just chose a new fabric that was consistent with the old one, but newer. And I had to wash the whole thing. Once I this is one of those things you think about, if I wash it right now, is it gonna make it worse? And it would have. So what I did was I did the repair first, and then I washed it. What do you wash with? Do you wash with cold water? No, warm water and, and Orvis. My sister talked last week about Orvis soap. It's a horse shampoo. And, you know, horses get into all kinds of muck when they're walking around. So it has to dissolve grease and, and mud. But it also has to be very gentle because horses actually have very, very tender skin. And so it's very gentle on your antique fabrics. This is another piece where I had to replace some of, of the little patches. And so I had to choose something that was going to be consistent with it. This one actually had yellow paint on it. So I had to work on it with, with uh, some solvents to get the paint off, as well as then washing it. Once I was finished, 
because you don't want the smell of the solvents. And here's another one. This, this one, I had to replace some of the patches that were completely worn through. But just by choosing fabrics that are consistent with the rest of the piece, you can make the patches actually pretty much disappear. That one looks beautiful. I think I'd like this one best of all. Yeah, I like that one too. Thank you. And here, this actually had a hole that went all the way through the quilt. So I had to patch the batting and the backing of the quilt and then uh, replace the patch on the front to make it look, um, look consistent. So you can do it, but it takes some care. The, here's some of the pieces that um, you all sent me um, pieces to look at. Um, this is Bronwyn's, it's a tea cozy. So when you make a pot of tea, if you want to keep it hot for a long time, you put something like this around it. Um, the modern tea cozies are, are generally not this shape, but she likes this one because it fits her pot. And you can see that the, the fabric is all worn and stained and she wondered what to do with it. So uh, one of the things that we talked about was to actually cover it. And she said, it would be nice if I had a zipper, I could take it on and off. Well, the problem is where do you- I think an zipper? invisible zipper would be good. An invisible zipper would be good. Well, but look, where would you put the zipper? You can't put it on one of these vertical sides. It's so thick. Well, not only that, but how would you get it off? Right. So you want I, something you could slip it right on, and then uh, with a velcro, uh, stick it together, right? Yeah, velcro is a possibility. That's right. If you were going to use the zipper, you would have to go around the circle, because then you could undo the zipper. It would have to be a, a separating zipper, like a jacket. And you could completely open that end and then slip it off. But the other thing is you could just make it and base it together, just like she did with the um, with that uh, chin guard on the quilt. Just put basting stitches to hold it together and then uh, you can take it apart to wash it and put it back together. How so, long yeah. is it? How long is it cozy? Uh, I'm not sure, and I think Bronwyn's microphone is off. Uh, it, it, it's probably easier if I don't go over to it. This is Janet's antique table cover. <clears throat> she sent me some pictures of this. This is a, a family piece that she loves. So we're just go with me. Let's inspect it a little bit. You can see the, the um, velvet. It's velvet. The velvet is worn so that the nap has been rubbed off in a lot of places. Yeah. And there are some holes here. This is a big hole. The red is actually the backing. Here's some more places. There's a hole. I like Janice's table cover. I like her table cover. Yes, it's very pretty. It seems and like it's been made out of a pair of, a pair of um, um, jeans. No, this is velvet actually, and um, this this embroidery is chenille, and it's beautifully done. So it's raised; it has a, a texture to it, and this red is the back. You can see it's pretty stained in the back. She knitted the flowers. She knitted the flowers. No, it's it's a, an embroidery technique, but it it's raised. So that if, if you were looking at it, it's at least a quarter of an inch high off of the, uh, the base fabric. So the first thing you do with a piece like this is you inspect it, just like we I'm just going did. to go now. I'm th bye, everybody. I'm going to go now. Okay. Thanks, Millicent. I'm glad you came. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. So... What it, our inspection showed us that we have stains to deal with, we have some holes to deal with, we have some wear spots, and there may be some loose bits in the embroidery too that might need to be secured. But then what's the sequence of events? What are we going to do first? Well, the first thing Shadow I would... Check I'm on the holes. 
That's right. So we need to, um, first of all, close up the holes so they don't get any worse. If we were going to wash it at this point, those holes would get worse. Uh, so we don't want to wash it until we've done the holes. And you then, don't even thread that strong enough. Right. It may not be strong enough for that at all. That's true. Any loose bits in the embroidery? I've done things that had little... Um, uh, beads on them or something like that. You want to make sure you've secured all those loose things because they may come off. And then take a look at those wear spots. Some, some of those, the fabric's pretty weak. You saw a couple of holes in some of the weak spots. So we really need to look at those carefully and ensure that that piece is going to be strong enough. And uh, for the stain, once we've done all these other things, then we'll deal with the things. And you can soak it, as Margaret described last week. Just put a little bit of soap, some warm water, and just let it sit. You can let it sit overnight um, in the bath or in a big container. I have a big, almost like a laundry basket, but that doesn't have holes in it. And I'll put it in that and just let it sit overnight. And then you can change the water and keep doing that for up to a week. Um, but you want to be very, very gentle with it because it's an old and very delicate piece. So let's look at this hole. What will we do with this hole? And don't forget the red is actually backing of the piece. So the first thing I'm going to look at is how strong are these edges? This looks like a pretty clean tear along this edge. Over here, you've got a pretty uh, extensive bit of ripping going on over here, right up to the embroidery. So we're going to have to be very careful, especially along that edge. So what I would do first is make a black patch that's larger than this flap. This is the flap that will turn back in, into this area. But we're going to make a black patch. And I'm choosing that because then the edges are going to disappear. It'll have black behind it instead of this red. And I'd make it at least a half inch bigger than the hole. So you're going to make a patch about like this. And then attach it to the flap. So I would sew it around these edges and paying particular attention to this rip here and get the flap to be very strong. And again, the patch is bigger than the flap, like a good half inch on all sides. And then you can flip the patch and flip that flap back into place. Now you've got some black behind it and you'll tuck the the edges underneath this black, and then carefully sew around it. So I would do this top edge first, and then this this side. It's it's tricky, and then the bottom edge. So the bottom edge looks pretty strong and pretty straightforward. And as you've turned this flap back in, as you sew this one. You're beginning to close up your, the space your hand can get under there. So that's why I'm doing the trickiest part first and this part the last. So this is still open and now we've got it back in there and we're sewing. So your hand sewing this joint at, at the bottom between the flap, the patch that's under, and this part. So we're just going to strengthen it as best we can and try to close it up so it so you don't notice the that it's there. But there are still wear spots. Claire, what were you saying? I didn't hear what you said, Claire. Oh, okay. And then we'll darn the edges. Once we've got it secured, then you darn the edges a little bit to strengthen it and to hide that joint. 
So here's an example. This is a quilt where I did something similar. Um, it's not as extensive, but you can see, and this is blown up a lot. So it's really much smaller than this. But here, this seam and this rip, there's a patch behind it to strengthen it. Would you say? I can't hear you. Claire, tell me again. Okay, so there's a patch behind it and then I'm sewing against that patch, not all the way through, so you don't want to see the stitches on the back of the quilt, but enough to strengthen it. So here is another place where there's a hole and you can see the red through it. So the red is calling attention to the hole. And the wear spots are another issue too. And over here, I've marked with the arrow where there's an older mend. You can see that they, they've patched this thing before. So any ideas about other things that you could do to hide those wear spots? Any ideas? Because we, we really can't just put a patch over this. That, that would probably call more attention to it. Sorry, Snowy is joining. How about a, a choice? Uh, yeah. My mother used to mend things with a weaving stitch. She used yes. to like weave it in, like even on our socks, and you'd never know that there was ever a hole in the sock because she'd make it like into a design. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, you one once you've made this strong around it, then what I mean by darning it is exactly what Claire just said. You would sort of weave, you'd make your stitches go one way, and then once you've done that, then you make your stitches go this way and you will go over and under. So you're essentially weaving your stitches across. But what I mean is, here's all, all these places where the fabric is worn. Is there anything that you could do to make that black again? Add another small piece of material and pack that, it on. That's possible over things. I don't know that I would do it with this. But one, another possibility is to do a permanent magic mark and uh, just color it black. So it depends what you're going to do with it. But um, if, if you were going to give this to a museum, I wouldn't touch it because a museum would not want you to do that. But depending what you're doing, you might choose to do something like just color it with a magic mark. This is Whitney's quilt. She sent me pictures of her quilt. And, and again, what do you do with it? Let's inspect it a little bit. Let's see what we're dealing with here. How big is the quilt? It's a bed size quilt. These are some blown up uh, areas just to show us what she's dealing with. So for example, what would you do with this one? Is this an area right here? Yes, you can see this, on? this one fabric has pretty much shredded. This rectangle is just plain gone. There's nothing there to mend. So I would replace that. So I would too. pick What's some fabric control? that looks looks consistent with the rest of the quilt. That's not almost it almost doesn't matter what it is in this particular quilt because they've got many different fabrics, but something that looks more or less consistent with with the rest of it. Remove the stitching that is holding this piece in place. Take out the whole thing just as if you were putting it in new. And then That's make it make a patch that's bigger than that space. That sounds like a good idea. And, but won't that be uh, expanding the uh, quote? If you add another piece of material? What, what we're, gonna, gonna we're gonna replace, we're gonna take out the old ones. So you take out all the stitching around this piece. 
Yeah. And, and, um, and tuck the new piece of fabric underneath it so that it's underneath the gold edge underneath this red print. Okay. And then sew it into place. You're going to hand stitch around it and try to reproduce all the stitching places that were there from before. And you can now see what type of stitch, what type of stitch do you use? Is this like a back stitch when you're replacing the piece of material, adding it on to the red material? Is like a, a, a back stitch or uh, how would you overcast or uh, what type of stitching? Well, I, I would try to make it look as much like the original stitching as possible. And the original stitching in this piece is uh, just a regular sewing machine stitch. So here I'm going to back stitch it so that it'll look more or less like machine stitching. Here's another piece and again w this this patch is simply shredded. It the material is no good. We're actually looking at the backing material here. You're close on the so same kind of a thing. And, and this one I wanted you to take a look at because it's, um, it's very similar to, to something that you're going to see. It, it's the result of a scant seam. The seam is a little bit too short. So whenever you are stitching something and you realize you, your seam is less than a quarter of an inch, remember this because this is how it's going to wear one or both of those sides will, will fray around that line. Here is the machine, as the material frayed, there wasn't enough of a healthy margin and it's pulled away. So in this case, since this, since this upper part is still healthy, that one's good. This red is the problem. But I wouldn't take out the whole thing. I think I would just take a piece of red material and put it under. And then you can turn this raw edge, just fold it back and sew it to your patch. And then sew it in. So you've probably got a quarter of an inch gap or a half inch gap. You'll just close up that gap and make sure that it's healthy on both sides. So this edge would get turned under and sewn to the patch. Okay. Tuck the patch under this healthy piece and hand stitch around it. And here I would watch the thread color because you want to do red against this red, but here she's got a black line of stitching. So you're going to change your thread color so that you match up with what she did originally. And this is a patch that's a little bit similar. This is this is one of my older quilts and it had a scan seam and this is what happened. You can see this is the original stitching and this lower patch has frayed away from it. So I had to figure out how to fix it. I put a little patch under here, under the rip, but I was able to just turn the edge. I can't hear you, Claire. What? Her, her audio is, is fractionating. So in this case, I had enough uh, of an edge to this material that I could turn it under and attach it to the seam allowance on the upper part. There was enough seam allowance there that I could do it. But if, if necessary, you can t um, put a patch in. Okay, and then this is the backing of Whitney's quilt. And you can see the fabric is pretty extensively ripped here. It's about six inches. And so what I would do here is just put a patch on top of it. We could patch it under 
and try to repair this, but it's the back thing. So it's not a, a big deal if it looks a little bit different. So I would just put a big patch over it. So you choose a fabric that's not gonna be too, too obvious but not worry too much about it. And, and as far as making the stitching similar, remember that your front is the most important part. So don't worry about being too fussy about where the lines go on the back. Look at the front and see what's going on. So just, Remember the goals when, whenever you approach this kind of a project, your goals are to keep the tear from getting any worse, to make the fabric look whole again, to keep this garment or quilt in service, and to make sure it's gonna survive the wash. Um, and in the case of an antique piece, you really need to think about what are you gonna try to do with it? You're gonna try to use it, or you're gonna hang it on the wall and display it maybe put it in a frame. Um, so I uh, just work, work to your goal. And that's our mending challenges for today. And thanks very much for joining us.